The Webot's robot simulator uses geometry for a couple of purposes. If you look at this model, we see a graphic rendition of the shape. In this case, this is the imported geometry we're going to talk about. And then there's a second geometry which is used for uh, collisions, which is the bounding volumes. And oftentimes those two should be different because in this case, the imported geometry has a lot of detail that would be very expensive to use in collision checking. And so it's desirable to then use a simpler geometry for simpler bounds checking. Simulation is always a question of choosing fidelity according to your purposes, so the right choice of geometries can vary quite a bit. But I want to point out a couple of things about this, because this was done using external, external geometry developed in a CAD system. So just to kind of outline the process in a larger way, here is Fusion 360, which I used to model at scale the various clock parts. And I followed kind of Fusion 360 practice of basically defining everything in position in the final assembly. As a result, all of the parts files that I created had their origin at the world origin. So basically all of my geometry shared a common reference point. That is going to be different among CAD systems and you'll get different kinds of outcomes. I used an STL file as the export because it's very portable. It's not very smart, but it, it's a very portable way to get geometry between systems. And I exported the three bodies separately, the bezel, which is the base, the minute hand, and the hour hand. One other thing to point out here is that this CAD system, like SOLIDWORKS and other CAD systems, uh, if you choose a body and look at its properties, uh, you get uh, mass properties. Uh, in this case, what we cared about was the, um, well, for the bezels, it doesn't participate in dynamics, so this is a little spurious, but um, there's a ma there's a some assumed density, which in this case corresponds to wood. There's a total mass, and then there are uh, moments of inertia, which are, um, what we care about here is the moments of inertia with respect to the center of mass. And it's, a, it's, a, it's drawn as a matrix, but it's always uh, symmetric, so it's really only six values. And then the center of mass location. And those are numbers that can be input directly into WeBots to define the physics property of an imported body. Because it doesn't have a, a, the same, because the bounding volume would normally be used to compute mass properties, and that might actually be different. In this case, it is helpful to have like a direct access to the num numbers for the mass properties. So the process was I exported these as STL files and then imported into WeBots. So we can try that right now. So if I go back to WeBots, um, I can go ahead and just try and doing an import just to see what happens. If I go to the file menu, there's an import 3D model option. And it launches a wizard that allows several imports. If I continue here, so here we have various STL files. Let's just for, for argument's sake, go ahead and re-import the bezel as an object. All right. And it will ask uh, for some question here. And mostly we're going to leave the use meshes for bounding objects turned off because we're not going to try to use this as a collision object. And so what we see now is that there's a new object in our scene tree here, solid. If I go ahead and move the viewpoint over that object, we see that it comes in looking a little bit sparse because what it is is it's, is it's pure geometry with some very bland uh, surface model rendering. But there it is. We have our polygons in place and it forms a solid. One subtlety is I don't know how each CAD system structures their STL files. In this case, what I noticed was there was a top level solid, which has a, as a child another solid, which then has, as a child had um, a shape object, which was of type uh, indexed face set. There we go, indexed face set. And so rather than use the double layer of solid, the actual object that I selected to cut and paste was this in, uh, internal solid object, which seemed to have all of the details that were relevant. The translation rotation uh, were, were basically just identity in both cases. I suspect this has something to do with the idea that maybe an STL file could have multiple bodies and we only had one. So that's sort of giving a quick taste of how you get the STL file in. Let's look at a slightly different issue here. The clock as defined right now is actually has no detail. You'll notice that there's only four parameters listed in the scene tree. And the reason for this is that I've already encoded the clock is what's called a proto file. We can look very briefly at that, although it is in the distribution. If I go to right click on clock and say view proto source, what we see is a VRML file that includes a couple of constructions. One is at the top is some specification of the user visible parameters. And there's tons of these examples within the WeBot system. If you look at any of the, of the sample robots, uh, they're almost all generated using a proto file and there'll be some system like this. So there's some user visible parameters and then there's a specification of a robot and effectively it's copied out of the world file. It's the same representation as is in the world file. Only there can be some uh, simple procedural elements to calculate values. In this case, um, nothing is calculated. 
except that there's some assignment to take the user specified parameters and map them into the model that we're seeing here. Translation is translation. Simply says use the user provided translation vector for the translation of the of the robot body. And that provides, um, and then it's possible to basically build in small bits of Lua that can calculate other values from this. And I do that on the two link model. That's a, a separate example. So we're not going to look too much at the proto files except to say that um, if you want to manipulate a given model, you can re expand it. So clock was generated when the world was loaded from the proto file by evaluating it. And it's evaluated each time. So if you edit the proto file, the objects will change in the world. But I can re-expand it by right click on clock and go to convert to base nodes. It will replace clock, which was this you know, object, with a new tree, which is basically the expanded form as a robot. And now all the kinematics are visible again. Um, nothing is specifically changed in the, in the system here, except that we get to sort of see inside of here. And now we can try to maybe uh, use my new object here kind of as a demo. Um, so let me get this insight. Okay, so if I go down now within my robot, which is once again the clock that I've expanded here, and I find the bezel, um, we can find its children nose and, and see there's a shape inside there, which is the uh, the shape of the um, of the I'm sorry, it's the shape object that we I had previously imported. Um, I could now go ahead and cut that and replace that, and we'll just let's just try that here. I'm going to cut that. So there is no shape anymore. Oops, there goes the bezel. And I'm going to I'm going to go find the corresponding shape object in my imported item here. And I'm going to just uh, cut that. And then I'm going to paste it back in. I'm pasting it into the children node of the bezel solid. Um, and bam, we have now uh, put that in place of the previous bezel. And what was lost with that was the uh, the appearance included some basic kind of color settings. Um, and, a, and a texture map of the wood that um, now went away. So if I, I can change the color on this um, and just change the basic color, this is just showing that the new object I imported. Not a dramatic change because it's the same geometry put back in place, only now minus the appearance, but it does sort of give you a taste of how that geometry can be imported as an object, sort of dissected and sort of pieces taken out as needed, either the solid or the sh underlying shape, and then inserted into another kinematic tree um, to get you the imported geometry inside of your kinematics. One last point on this particular model. You'll notice that the, the bounding, I lost it there, sorry. Um, we're looking at the bezel solid and the bounding object on it is null. That's because it has no collision checking. But also the physics is null. If the physics is null on the bezel, it won't participate in dynamics and it becomes a fixed object. And this is why, in this case, the actual base of the, of the, of the robot, the clock, um, has no specific mass properties. It's simply not allowed to move. It never participates in the physics. It's a fixed reference frame. So that is a convenient way to define a robot as having being fixed to the ground or fixed in space, actually. Um, null physics means it won't get gravity and it won't get contact. It'll, it'll simply stay in place. So there you go. That's a very quick walkthrough for how you might, uh, from CAD, um, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing to point out here. Um, if I look now at the other elements here, I look at the, well, let's say the, the minute hand, and I find its solid body, it does have physics. And what we see here is that um, it has numbers taken from the CAD system. The center of mass of the minute hand is the vector from the world origin to the center of mass of the minute hand as calculated in Fusion 360. And the inertia matrix, there's six numbers. They're the diagonal of the inertia matrix and then the three um, off-axis terms stored as two vectors here that were also calculated from Fusion 360. So those should be fairly accurate, assuming a uniform density model made out of, in this case, red oak. Um, and the mass numbers were also taken from Fusion 360. So by copying this over and setting the density to minus one, I can create a reasonably accurate physics representation without having a bounding volume. Of course, it does mean that if you try to drop something through the clock, it shouldn't collide. It's not going to be physically realistic in that sense but at least the internal dynamics should be reasonable. Okay, so that, that should maybe give you some hints as to how to incorporate more complex geometry into your own models.